for um, a few moments, I'm going to talk about the greatest running moments in history. Who here likes to run? Anybody like to run? I'm glad we are a fit church <laughs> here at King's Church at West. Um, I, uh, I'd rather not run, but I love to watch it. <laughs> I love to watch the sport of running. I think it's, I think it's fascinating that a whole career uh, that can be defined by seconds. I mean by seconds, right? Seconds. But like, like it's hard to even like speak about like running without talking about the goat of running, which is Usain Bolt, the Jamaican runner, Usain Bolt, the best runner of all time. He once ran a 100-meter dash, hear this, this is crazy, in 9.58 seconds. Nine point, I mean, it's a world record. I mean, 9.58 seconds, the fastest person in the world, Usain Bolt, amazing. Who here has ever run a marathon? Anybody? No one. Okay, cool. Um, I love like to watch. Now, th- th- like marathons is extremely hard to watch because it's 26.2 miles, right? People actually choose to do this. People actually choose to put their body in so much gruel. Like, like I personally think it's not natural for you to put your body through that much pain and suffering, 26.2 miles Why? We're just bragging rights, 20, like, 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 like 26.2 miles of marathon, great stuff. Now, there's this man that tried to beat the, the uh, best time for a marathon, right? There's this experiment of, like, who can run a marathon the fastest, and there is this guy by the name of, hold on, let me get this right, Elihud Kepchogi. He is uh, from Kenya, and they set up a marathon in Vienna, Austria. And this man ran a marathon in one hour and 59 minutes, and I believe in 40 seconds. This man ran 26.2 miles in one hour, 59 minutes, and 40 seconds. Amazing. Like completely just incredible that that he would run a marathon for that long under two hours. Completely incredible that he would run that fast. Now, one thing is true is that there have been uh, moments of greatness and uh, Records broken and, and things amazing, all type of stuff. But one thing is true is that humans run real fast, right? Humans run real fast. Now, we're going to speak about uh, like another runner by the name of, of course, Anisimus. But to know his story, we actually have to kind of step into his story of a first century slave. Now, this man, of course, Anisimus, a slave, he, he's, uh, you know, um, our uh, idea of slavery is way different than, of course, what the Bible meant about slavery, right? First being is that back in the Bible time is that slavery actually wasn't about race. Praise God, right? That in the Bible that slavery wasn't about cruel racism, it wasn't about about race, it was strictly about something that was about like your status, about about who you are, about about what you were raised in. Slavery was as as common to the world as fuel is like to us, is that people own slaves to just run the world. And this thing happened is that, that, is that when a master, of course, owned a slave, is that the slave was of, course, was, of course, at the mercy of its master. And just because it was different, of course, it doesn't mean that it was right. That a slavery was still abused, a, a, a slave was still mistreated, a slave was still treated as property and not as a person. 
And so, of course, Anesimus, now, of course, we don't know too much about what happened between Philemon and his slave Anesimus. But what scholars would agree is that Anesimus stole some property from him. That Anesimus stole something from him. And of course, the punishment for that was ultimately death. They didn't uh, take it easy on slaves. That when you wronged your master, or when you defrauded your master, or when you hurt your master, or when you do, or when you break the law, that you were at the mercy of the master. And, And the master could choose whether to kill you or to stone you or punish you or remove your wage or whatever, he was at at the mercy. And so, of course, Anesimus, knowing his wrong and knowing what he did wrong and knowing what happened, guess what he does? He runs. He runs, and he runs to Rome, which is kind of crazy because where he was to Rome was actually 1,300 miles from where he was. And so rather than walk 13 steps to actually deal with the problem, (laughs) he actually runs 1,300 miles all the way from Colossae to Rome. How, like, like how funny it is that sometimes as human beings that we'd rather run 1,300 miles away from the problem (laughs) than actually 13 steps to actually deal with it. But that's a whole nother sermon, and I can't actually preach that today. But it speaks to this, that this, this human problem that we all have is that when we face sin and guilt and shame and, and, and our own brokenness and, and burden and weight and all these things, what do we do? We run. We run. We run, and, and, and we think that by running, we can actually escape the feeling that I feel or escape kind of the, 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 the emotions that, that I feel. And so we think, well, if I just, you know, change my job, then maybe what I feel inside of me will, will actually change. Well, maybe if I, you know, found a new spouse, that'll help then maybe something would change inside of me. But, but, but maybe if I didn't see you no know, potholes in all of New Brunswick, then maybe I wouldn't have lost my temper. Or maybe if my parents weren't so crazy, then I wouldn't have so much trauma and drama in my life. Maybe if I just moved to Hawaii, then maybe my heart wouldn't feel so depressed or bleak or sad. And so we fail to realize that we think that what is outside of us can actually fix what's inside of us. And we fail to realize that our our greatest problem is not outside of us, but is actually inside of us. Y'all are very quiet this morning. We fail to realize that our greatest problem is not outside of us, it's actually inside of us. That there is a sin issue, that there is issues and trauma and things and baggage. And, and so we, we lash out or we get angry or, we, or we, try to, we try to move or we try to run or we try to be quiet or we try to, or try to like remove ourselves from situations. And while that may be helpful, the truth is, is that you can never outrun you. Oh, my Lanta, Georgia. The reality is, is if, if you have been a human being, a humanoid, a person with skin and bone, with, I mean, flesh on, with a soul, if you've been on this planet long enough, you will realize that you can never outrun you. <laughs> Running you will be a race you will lose every single time. 
Why? Because the problem, again, is not outside of us, but it's inside of us. That we have monsters, we have things, we have secrets, we have past, we have pain. And what we do, we run thinking that, that if I run, then I can escape, that I can remove myself from situation. And then we try to find a, a solution for an ongoing problem, which is me. <laughs> I can't run from me. You can't run from you. And no matter how far you run and no matter how far you go and no matter try, you will never leave the ongoing problems and the issues that are within you. And of course, Anesimus, he, he ran for, for the things that he's done, but really he's running from Himself. He doesn't want to want to feel the guilt or the shame or the sin. It's like my son. I mean, he's he's almost two years old. I mean, just even as a as a young child, he knows that he if he starts to do something wrong and he hears <laughs> and he hears mom and dad coming around the corner, what do you think his his first response is? He's dipping. He's running. He's walking like a penguin, too. And you know what? He's slow. (laughs) And that's the thing with us is that we think that we're trying to escape and run from us. But what we don't know is that you are slow. (laughs) And so the reality is, is that we will never outrun us. But here's the great truth and here's the great news today is that you can never outrun God's grace. Ha, 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 ha! I'm preaching to myself today. While we think you can outrun you, you can never run from you. And let me tell you and let me remind you that you can never outrun God's and grace. And we see this as while Anesimus is running from Philemon and running from the drama and running from the pain and running from the situation. While he is running, he's running to Rome to speak to this guy by the name of Paul that he's probably heard about, of course, amongst the church. So he runs to him, and while he's running, there is a shaker and there's a mover in his story that he doesn't know about, and it's God's grace pursuing him. That while he's trying to run from the situation and run from God and and run from his mistake, there is a power, there is something pursuing and running and chasing after him. And little does he know that this stranger named Paul knows Jesus. And Paul has been radically changed by Jesus. And Paul is, is a man who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. And Paul is a leader and a bishop. And Paul leads him to know Jesus and leads him to faith. And we know this because, because Scripture says that he has become my son in the faith. Paul says he's become my son. He's become someone who's actually professed the name of Jesus. That while he was running, grace was actually chasing after him. And there's three things that I believe grace does for us as we look through this book of Philemon. There's three things that I really hope that you get this about what grace does. And number one is this, is that grace pays my debt. Did you hear it? Paul said it. He said Charge it to me. I will pay it back. Who does this sound like? Like Jesus. He says, charge his debt, his wrong to me. Let me pay it back. And that is the grace of God. The grace of God will pay your debt. See, see that sin problem that you have, that habit, that thing, your marriage, your frustration, those problems like within you can only take from what's outside of you to help you, to fix you, to heal you, to change you, and that is the grace of God. But that sin problem has a receipt. (laughs) And as much as you try to run from the sin in you, it deserves punishment. It deserves death. There is a penalty for that sin. 
And as much as I try to run from that and try to run from that, God continues in his grace, says, charge it to me. Charge it to me. Let me pay it for you. You know, I love, uh, you know, like my young self, um, when I was a, a high schooler, my youth a pastor would say these golden words. And maybe, of course, it, it, like if you've been in church long enough, you've, you've heard these golden words that just blessed my soul. He would actually pick us up, and then we'd go to McDonald's. <laughs> yes, Lord. And I'd be, you know, you know, and I'm trying to scheme and think, okay, what should I buy? I'm a struggling high schooler. I don't make no money. I just asked my mom for everything. And then he says these golden words, you can get whatever you want. And I'm like, oh, for real? He's like, yeah, you can get whatever you want. And I'm like, why? He's like, because I love you. You're great. It's on me. <gasps> Are you serious? Hence why I am the size that I am today. But that's besides the point. <laughs> but the truth is, Israel is in the same way that Jesus looks at your sin. He looks at the worst part of you, that he looks at the thing that you're running from, and he says, charge it to me. Charge that punishment to me. And while we deserved separation, and while we deserved distance, and while we deserved death, and while we deserved hell, and while we were considered, of course, enemies before God, he says, charge it to me. And only the grace of God can give you what you and I don't deserve. He says, charge it to me. Another thing is this, is that grace pays my debt, but also grace gives me a new name. Paul says this, he says, formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to me. Now this is hilarious. Because the name Anisimus means useful. Oh my gosh. So Paul is kind of doing a little like play on words here. He says, formerly he was useless to you, but now he's useful. But noticed that while he was useless, his name didn't change. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that while what defined him was useless, and what made him useless, his name didn't change. What has rendered your life from being useful? What has stolen from you, and what has defined you, and what has trapped you? But grace says that while you have gone through the mud and gone through the pain and gone through the suffering and gone through the addiction and gone through the grace and the grief, that there is grace for us that while our lives have been in, 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 in trash, in, in rubbish, but our name doesn't change. That while we see rubbish, God sees the person that he has created you to be. He sees useful, and while we may see useless, God sees useful. What has in your past defined you? What has shaken you? What has trapped you? Grace gives you a new name. See, I don't know about you, but I've been around so much stuff, and I've seen friendships and, 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 and people who have gone through some serious stuff and addictions and crimes and things, and you think in your head, man, you're done. You are wrapped up. You, like, that's it. Adios. Bye-bye. Saranar. Like, you are done. And just when we start to give up on a person and just when we start to walk away from someone, God says, ah, no, 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 don't run too fast. Because that person, that thing is still useful to me. While you may see useless, God sees useful because only the gospel 
can find you at your worst, but yet God sees and God still sees how he made you to be. Only the gospel, only the grace of Christ can see the worst in us and see the bad in us and see the dirty and the things that I don't want to see and the things that I don't want to confront and the things that I'm running from. But yet he says that I can restore that, that I can redeem that, that what is useless I see as useful. Grace pays my debt. Grace gives me a new name. And then lastly, grace welcomes you back. Grace welcomes you back. You know, Paul says this. He says this in, uh, in verse 17. He says, welcome him as you would welcome me. That when I look at my stain and when I look at my shame, God says to, to, like Jesus says to God the Father, he says, welcome me as you would welcome him. Welcome him. And while we are running and while we are trying to run from God and run from our sin and run from our situation and our pain, God says, you are welcome back. We all, the, we all know the story back in Genesis where the first sin happens. Adam and Eve sinned. And notice God's first words. His first words wasn't, how could you? What is wrong with you? His first words wasn't, come on, bro. Like, are you serious? Like, you should know better. Like, what, like, what, like what's going on? His first words was what? Where are you? His first words wasn't trying to shame you or trying to guilt you or trying to, trying to hurt you and trying to, trying to find you and trying to hunt you down. His grace was his first response. And he said, where are you? And God is saying to wherever you are, whether online or at West or here, that while you are running from him, if you just dare to look back, you'll see a God who is behind you who's saying, where are you? I am wanting to be close. I'm wanting to be with you. I'm wanting to be around you. And while we try to run from the stain and the sin and the shame, and while I am separated from him, God is wanting to pursue me. And God is running after me. And God's grace is pursuing me. And God says through the cross, he says, welcome back. Come on home. Because the gospel is not that, that we ran to him. See, the gospel is that he ran to us. And so Paul is trying to set this foundation of, 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 of the next thing that we'll see next week about, about restoration and reconciliation is that Paul is brilliantly implying the gospel without actually mentioning it. <laughs> he says, charge it to me and I'll pay it back. Welcome him back. I will take care of it. He's showing the gospel to Philemon so that Philemon and Anesimus can then find reconciliation and healing. Because if we are going to find the, the, the gospel's application and the implication, we have to get a revelation that we have been reconciled to God. And we can't exhaust ourselves of this very gospel and this truth. Is that while yet I was still a sinner, that God through his grace found me and he saw me and he fixed me and he picked me up and he turned me around and he cleansed me and he washed me and he redeemed me and he rescued me. Only the grace of God. It is not that you've earned it. It is not that you've deserved it. But it's that you just receive it. You just receive the grace of God for your life and for my life. That he pays for your sin. 
that he gives you a new name, that he, he calls you useful, that he stares at our past and our junk and our pain, and he says it's useful, and he says, welcome, like, like come on back home, welcome home. God in his grace welcomes you and me. And let me just tell you this, is that humans are fast, very, very fast. But let me, let me just tell you this, that you are not faster than God. My God, who is Jehovah Jireh, El Shaddai, the Lord of Lords, the, the King of Kings, El Shaddai is what I call him, El Shaddai. I dare you to challenge him to a race. You think your sin is way too much or that your wrong, of course, outweighs his good and his grace, but let me remind you today that you will lose every time. Because the grace of God and the goodness of God is running after you. And his good and his grace and his amazingness and his glory outweighs your bad and your pain and, and your drama and your mistakes. His grace is so, 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 so good. So how do we like apply this? Is that like for us, we actually have to get real with ourselves. You know, for some of us, we're lying to ourselves. And when we run from our sin and when we run from the problem inside of us, what are we doing? We are lying to ourselves. And we need to get real with ourselves and just, and just recognize that my sin's a problem, that I have desires, that I have inclinations, that I act on. God, I need you. And we need to recognize that there is a sin problem in us. But second, we need to get real with God. We need to get honest before God. And that's, that's not for him, but that's for us to really hear ourselves before God and say, God, I am wrong. God, I'm a sinner. I am separated from you, and I need you. We need to get honest before God, and we need to be transparent. We need to rip off the mask and the things that we're hiding in the past secrets and the pain and the sin and the stains and the things that we're running from and say, God, okay, finally, I quit. I'm, I'm done running. I am here before you, God, and just get honest before the Lord. And then three, this thing is hard. This thing is super hard, but that we get real with others. You know, the Bible says this. It says, it says to um, uh, um, like confess your sins to each other that you may be healed. We confess to other people, not so that we can be like, ah, but so that we can be healed, so that people can, can, can speak into our lives and find us and say, hey, here I am. So we need to get real with God and get real with ourselves and get real with each other. So what are you running from? What are you running from? The past? A marriage, a divorce, addiction, a habit, anger. God says, just, just turn, just turn, repent. You are welcome back. I paid your debt. You have a new name. Welcome home. Here's what Romans says, and we're going to end with this, and I'm going to pray, and thanks for your patience. Romans 5, again, Paul, he knows what it means to be reconciled to God, and he says this in Romans 5, verse 6. He says, like, you see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. That though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, 
Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, while we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Can you receive like the relevant, the, the uh, revelation like today that you've been reconciled to God? That while we were still enemies, that God reconciled you and me. Would you stand with me, please, over the room? Would you uh, place your hand over your heart like today? You know your heart. And you know what you're running from. Would you just, in your own words, just ask the Lord to just show you his grace? Say, Holy Spirit, show me where your grace is in my life. Show me how good you've been to me. And maybe for some of you, that's a reminder of his faithfulness and his grace to you, how he's found you and redeemed you. And maybe for some of you, you have not experienced that grace. You have not experienced him chasing after you and pursuing you. He's inviting you to know him and to experience his grace. Father, in the name of Jesus, we love you today. Lord, I thank you that your message is not based on, of course, eloquence, but that it's, it's backed by the power of God. God, I pray that your people online and here at Valley and at West and PEI and, and Halifax, that God, that you would manifest your grace like to them. Father, I just pray that we just stop running. Running from our own junk and running from our own stains and sins and the issues in our hearts and that we would by faith receive your grace today. And God, I pray that by your grace that we'd be changed. That by your grace, God, I just pray that you remove shame today. And the shame of hiding and the in the embarrassment of, of, of uh, God, like, do you see my sin and do you see this thing? God, I just pray that, that, that you would remove the shame and remove the embarrassment. And I pray that, that, that by repentance and by turning to you and by changing our heart and our mind to you, that your grace would receive us that your grace would wash us, that your grace would fix us so that we can live our lives for your unending glory. Lord, we love you today. Lord, we thank you. We praise you for your grace, your glorious grace. So, Lord, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, we all said amen, amen, amen.